Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael in for Franz Stoddard. They are intelligent, adaptable, and highly social. On winter nights, common crows gather in communal roosts of thousands or even tens of thousands of birds. Sleeping close to one another makes it easier to fend off the cold, and sleeping in large numbers is believed to provide collective protection against predators. For our first segment today, Across the Fence visits with bird expert Mark Labar of Audubon, Vermont, about the American crow. Crows are fascinating, and it seems like, especially in the winter, their behavior is a little bit different. Tell me a little bit about them in general. Well, crows are, are very uh, intelligent birds. They're in the corvid family, so they're in there with ravens and blue jays. In the wintertime, they use a strategy of roosting in, in large numbers. Sometimes uh, they can be in the thousands, um, where they'll all collectively hang together. Uh, they're very social by nature. So you can often see them right at the end of the day migrating or moving towards, I guess would be, to their communal roost sites. Uh, oftentimes these can be in a city or close to the city. Uh, crows like uh, um, an open habitat, so lots of ag land. You usually don't find crows in uh, the forest, so to speak, you know, when you have straight up woods, because they like to use those fields for feeding. And oftentimes you find them in urban settings uh, because the light uh, from the uh, from the buildings and, and just the city protects them a little bit because uh, their predators, uh, great horned owls, will uh, not come into the city when it's lit like that. How is their behavior different in the winter than it would be at other times of the year? Well, as they start to progress and as you get towards the breeding season, uh, those big roosts will begin to break up. But again, because crows are um, very social creatures, they will often move in family groups. You will have younger birds, so birds that hatched and survived uh, you know, from the previous year or two will often help their, the adults in raising the next brood. So you can have uh, groups of crows that'll, you know, they'll set up a nest spot and then a number of different crows moving back and forth to, to feed the young. And what do they eat in the winter? Uh, you know, they're pretty om omnivorous, you know, they'll eat a little bit of everything. Um, you know, if there's snow cover, they might be forced to, to try to find uh, some carrion that's already been, you know, that's around, so something that might be dead. Um, but as soon as the ground cover opens up, you know, worms and insects, uh, sometimes bird eggs, uh, you know, they're very advantageous. Uh, they'll visit um, dumps. Uh, agricultural fields, you can often see them uh, moving through as folks, you know, they plow the fields or uh, they're doing some planting. Um, somewhat notorious in that they'll actually pull up some of the seedlings, so they don't necessarily have a great reputation amongst the farmers, but a little bit of everything. If somebody wanted to observe crows, where would they go? It's interesting because crows seem to be a bird that you, you know, you find pretty regularly. I, often I can look out the window and I can see crows. But if you talk to a, a crow hunter, you know, they can be actually very difficult to, to track down. Uh, again, agricultural fields, uh, areas that have some degree of openness. If you do know where a, a, a roost is, like a winter roost, uh, you can visit that site too and be pretty much guaranteed that you'll be seeing the birds come in in the evening. How do they communicate with each other? They have a lot of different sounds. Everybody knows the caw, caw, caw of the crow. Uh, but there's lots of different vocalizations that they'll use as well. So, a pretty vast repertoire. What are they trying to say to each other? You know, a lot of bird communication is, is just that, especially with a social creature such as the crows. So these different sounds that they make uh, are often just individual birds uh, staying in touch with uh, other uh, crows. And so we know that some birds uh, like to sing in the springtime when it's breeding time and in the summer. Um, but crow communication is, is a little bit more guttural and, you know, these birds, uh, you know, they're just keeping in touch with their neighbors. You might also be interested in knowing that pairs of male and female crows will stay together year after year. In the spring, they'll work together to make a nest and the female will generally lay three to eight eggs. The young chicks are full feathered at four weeks old and they learn to fly during the month of June. A farmer's market, a farm tour, and cutting your own Christmas tree are all examples of agritourism. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, agritourism in Vermont is worth more than $50 million a year. 
For our next story, Across the Fence travels to Randolph, where Keith Silva tells us about a traditional home for nomads that's become the place to stay in central Vermont. Jen Colby has held many jobs in Vermont agriculture, from working for UVM Extension as a pasture specialist to raising sheep and pigs on her own farm. A few years ago, when she and her family moved to this farm in Randolph, she knew it was the right time and place to assume a new role in Vermont's working landscape. I got into raising meat animals because we were meat eaters and wanted to be responsible about it, which eventually led into a competitive barbecue experience for 12, 13 years. Taking meat and preparing it in a loving and, and competent way was really important to us. And through that, we did a lot of hospitality too. We just did meals, we did events, we hosted people, we cooked for people, we cooked for friends and family. And so having a background where we hosted people, it just seemed like the next natural step would be to host people overnight. What Colby cooked up next was how to have guests stay overnight. So she and her family built a yurt. It's a round tent. It's actually designed to be portable. I'm not planning to move it anywhere, but uh, they're structured, they're based on the Mongolian Gur tent. This one's insulated. They hold in their heat. They create this beautiful round space. There's something really wonderful and comfortable in them. When we bought this farm, we, we knew we wanted to have guests. We knew we wanted to share this farm with other people and we wanted to share farming in general, but also just a place for people to relax and be away and reconnect with themselves. And so we walked around the farm, we got to this spot and we said, this is it, this is totally it. And uh, we've had so much great feedback from people that have stayed with us that this is just a wonderful space. For $130 a night, you and up to five guests can stay in the yurt any time of year and experience farm life or not. To be able to help people better understand where food comes from in a very low key way, they can choose to engage or not. They can come out and move the sheep with me in the morning. They can visit the lambs. They can completely not interact with me. They can go for walks. Really, whatever level people want from this space, they can have, uh, they can get, and they can create it themselves. And I love that. I love that sort of lower key kind of farm stay agritourism where I'm not doing overt programming. Mm -hmm. We're not doing, you know, at, at one o'clock we do the tour of this and at two o'clock we do the tour of that. That wasn't what I had in my, in my head. It was really people, it's a choose your own adventure. <laughs> the term agritourism was coined in the 1970s. What started as a trend in Europe when agriturismos began frequenting farms and staying in historic castles has been widely adopted to cover any on-farm experience, from stopping by a roadside stand to overnight stays. Farmers like Colby serve to meet guests where they're at in terms of what they want to do. There are other residents on a farm whose agendas differ with this guest-first philosophy. Last fall, I had to warn one of my guests that uh, we were going to be weaning the lambs. And I said, you know, by the time you come, I think they'll be pretty quiet. But the first couple of nights, they are, they are like teenagers who don't realize that they can be independent. But they can be independent. So, you know, I just want to warn you of that. And she said, oh, I've had teenagers. It's no problem. <laughs> But it's sort of that interaction that, um, you know, this is lambing time. Most of the time that goes well, we lamb out on pasture now. Folks might see a brand new lamb. They might see a situation where it hasn't gone well. And I just, I tried to give folks a heads up about that. This kind of honesty is part of agritourism. Colby wants to be upfront with guests, as well as fellow farmers who might like to become hosts. Don't sugarcoat your descriptions. I mean, don't make it sound dire either. <laughs> you know, we have life and death on a daily basis. I don't mean that, but, but be, you know, be realistic that this is a working farm and, um, you know, and you never know what you might see on a daily basis. Um, there might be an escape of animals. 
which could be very entertaining for guests, a little less entertaining for the farmer. But um, those kinds of things, uh, for people to understand that we move the animals every day, you might see them, they might be right near you, you might not see them, they might be completely elsewhere. Um, just to recognize that every single day on a working farm is going to be a little bit different and not everybody is into a composting toilet, but, but for folks who were happy it wasn't an outhouse, they're very happy. The pros and cons of the composting toilet aside, Colby recognizes not all farmers are cut out for the agritourism business. Lots of folks get into farming because they don't want to interface with people. <laughs> They, they like animals or they, you know, they like growing things and they don't necessarily want to interface with human beings to be successful at it. It requires somebody who, is, who wants to host. Colby hosted her first visitor a little over a year ago. She advertises with the online vacation rental site Airbnb. Like farming, experience has been a great teacher. Think about what's gonna set you up well with Airbnb because people live and die on those reviews and it is a fantastic investment to make sure you have an excellent welcome basket, to make sure that everything is clean, that you pre-test with friends and family and other guests um, of different kinds so that they can tell you what you're missing before you open it up to the public because I, I feel like we've really benefited from having done that. It was the recommendation um, and we started with a lower price to get some really great feedback from folks as well and that's been really excellent for us. We've come to realize it's about connecting the world. It's not just about this little yurt in the middle of Randolph. Looking out over the valley, it's easy to see why this would be a nice place to stay, even if it's only for a night or two in Randolph. I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Our thanks to Jen at Howling Wolf Farm, and we know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit Across the Fence.